Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining our session today. Uh, we are here and are very excited to talk about our Enroll developed tool called Distribution Integration Solution Cost Options, or DISCO for short. Next slide, please, Shane. So uh, this tool called DISCO addresses uh, some present challenges that we face as researchers uh, who are working in the distributed energy resource space in general. A uh, lot of the times what we have been seeing is we see separate tools who ex which exist or platforms which uh, allow us to do separate problems or separate issues regarding DERs in general, but there's a lack of having one single tool or pipeline that can help us do a more holistic grid analysis with DERs. So with that in mind, uh, we tried to design a tool that will have a modular architecture um, under its hood and can build up on different types of analysis in a cascaded or a streamlined manner. So that way it's easier for uh, researchers to address a bunch of different questions that are coming up as we see more and more DERs being adopted in the grid, in the distribution grid. Uh, the other uh, focal point for DISCO that, uh, that we could address is really looking at beyond the technical plane. So we do have a lot of good set of tools which can uh, accurately model the technical side of things of having DERs, but the economic plane or uh, the dollar values are still being uh, integrated into these technical tools. So we have this uh, module under DISCO called Network Upgrade Analysis, and we'll talk about in details um, in a few minutes. So that one can take a look at what type of costs are associated with having network upgrades to accommodate a certain level of DER. So the uh, underlying goal here is to help make decision makers um, an informed decision, uh, depending on what type of network upgrades might be needed to have a certain level of DERs. Next slide. So a little bit of a backstory of DISCO. So these are, uh, this is something that we started with a couple of years ago uh, when DISCO was being funded by uh, solar and energy technology offices. So this is, um, we started with the distributed EV landscape and we, try, we were trying to build up this tool, uh, which will help us do a bottom-up analysis on distribution system planning. Uh, so that was the goal at that time, and uh, really understand how distributed PV impacts the uh, overall grid operation. Um, we wanted to include a good uh, kind of a novel hosting capacity analysis methodology at that time that looks at um, time series variability or dynamic nature of having uh, loads and PV generation in the grid. Uh, that's a little different from the way traditional hosting capacity was being dealt with at that point of time. So, and obviously the one goal that still remains is really creating a replicable pipeline that you don't need to write codes for every time you do a new project, every time you uh, work with a different and new stakeholder and really having this process in place, which can be uh, used on, once and again to have and answer these questions. Next slide, please. So cut to a couple of years later, right now, uh, DISCO has a lot of good set of capabilities uh, gone, uh, being gone through a lot of evolutions in the, uh, in the time. Um, right now we can do analyzing grid impacts and hosting capacity um, for both PV and electric vehicles, EVs. Um, we, we are doing it for um, the snapshot, the way usually hosting capacity questions are being asked, as well as the time series one, which, uh, which is one of the USB of uh, DISCO here. Uh, the other important module, as I mentioned, is having this distribution upgrade cost analysis that gives us a little bit of a um, peek into how 
techno-economic benefits can be uh, part of having the uh, adoption um, of the overall plan. Um, beyond that, so just from the tool aspect of it, uh, this is a modular framework. It's open source, like, like a lot of other tools that you've seen here at Android, built on Python application. It uses um, OpenDSS as the underlying PowerFlow engine and um, solves that iterative PowerFlow uh, problems when needed. Uh, on the other hand, this actually has a um, bigger and uh, a bigger scale in mind. So what I mean is, if you have a lot of mathematical problems, meaning a lot of feeders to really focus on, then Disco can uh, take that problem, break it down, and use high performance computing ar architecture, such as uh, such as one we have here at Android, and really uh, run it fast. Because you can understand if it's a lot of a uh, number of feeders that might take a long time um, computationally. But that doesn't really limit this code to having an HPC in the background. Uh, you can also run it in your own laptop or uh, your local servers. Like if you really want to just do a research problem focused on a few um, feeders instead, you can also do that using this code. Next slide. All right. So all in all, what are the types of questions uh, we can expect to answer with DISCO? Um, the first and foremost is obviously trying to understand what goes, how many, what's the level of PERs that can be accommodated within a community standard grid um, infrastructure. So that PERs, meaning it can be PVs and EVs, as I mentioned, um, is it's actually essentially the hosting capacity problem that we are talking about. So that's one of the major questions that we could answer with this scope. And the next one is, what are the types of grid impacts we can expect having a certain level of DDRs? And it doesn't have to be beyond hosting capacity, although we can do that. Um, it can be anything that's between the current uh, adoption level versus um, maybe a futuristic goal that a utility has in mind, for example. So we can see what type of impacts uh, that scenario is bringing on for the grid. And we have this plethora of different technical metrics to really analyze and quantify those impacts in terms of metrics. So that gives us a bit of flexibility of what you exactly need and what type of um, parameters you need to look at for your analysis. Uh, the other set of questions really get into this um, changes that a distribution system infrastructure may need to go with. So as you can understand, having a certain level of PV and EV comes with its own um, challenges. Um, sometimes the grid is not um, robust enough or resilient enough to handle these additional levels of DERs. So what type of uh, infrastructure changes or upgrades um, a planner needs to go through to make sure that level of DR adoption can be accommodated. Um, and how would that impact the reliability and the power quality um, of the grid infrastructure? So this kind of uh, technical questions can also be answered in DISCO. And the other side of things is really the costs, because a lot of the times costs can be the uh, barrier to really get to a certain point of DR adoption level. So a type of cost a uh, utility might be looking at or a researcher might be looking at to make sure that the year adoption is met. So that type of uh, questions can be answered with this code. And the last one here is really trying to understand the overall situations. Um, are there controls that could be um, embedded here that could help us reduce the costs? Uh, are there uh, other factors that need to be understood as we understand as we really assess this techno-economic um, analysis here. So um, all of these are part of the overall DISCO pipeline and can be answered with DISCO. Next slide. So this one, um, for this section, I'll just quickly go over um, how DISCO works, what are the types of capabilities and methodologies that we have under the hood, um, and this slide here particularly really simplifies of how DISCO workflow um, is designed. So um, as a lot of other 
distribution um, focused tools, we start off with a set of models. Usually those are planning models and we um, need to have this open DSS models in place. So um, not to worry, like if we have other types of models, then uh, there are other tools in place which can help us convert them into open DSS and really uh, get started with this tool. So once we have a set of validated and um, finalized models in place, then what we can do is really understand what type of analysis we are going to focus on. So this is where the modular architecture really comes in handy. Like you can choose that I, I just want to know how the hosting capacity is looking like for a certain set of readers. Then uh, that's the type of command you type in um, and you uh, really set up the parameters that you want to focus on as far as hosting capacity goes. Uh, same goes for automated upgrade cost analysis. Like if you want a certain DR scenario adoption type, uh, you can put that in and uh, customize the parameters and really do that configuration for just the automated upgrade cost module. Um, so once we do all those configurations and uh, parameter design, then we can run all the simulations and post-process the results. This is where also users have some flexibility, really trying to filter the types of results that you are interested in. Um, so that's why the post-processing is um, really important and crucial because um, we do generate a lot of different results, but obviously not all of them are of uh, interest to everyone. Next one. All right, so this is a quick look at how hosting capacity analysis methodology is addressed under the hood of DISCO. So the goal of um, DISCO's PV or host, EV hosting capacity is aimed at identifying the levels of PV and EV um, uh, to see what type of, when it starts to negatively act the grid operation. So if uh, you are a little familiar with hosting capacity analysis, um, then you'll know that there's hardly any straightforward or strict definition of hosting capacity. But we, what we are trying to see is uh, that uh, upper limit of having PV or EV, where we start to see that maybe the voltages or the thermal loading levels are being violated. So that, uh, that's the question that we are hoping for, uh, hoping to answer for. And uh, there are, uh, the next slide please, different types of answering this question, uh, different approaches that we can take to answer these questions. Uh, one, one type of uh, variation can be really looking at the grid locations, different types of grid locations. Uh, we could go by single location at a time where we, uh, you know, uh, the distribution grid nodes, one node at a time we are understanding what's the uh, limiting factor or the hosting capacity for that particular grid node. Or we can also design a cluster or scenario-based approach here where we can um, assume that there are a, a cluster of nodes instead of one. So that kind of goes back to the, uh, to the real factor. Like if my neighbor is actually getting uh, an EV, then it's very likely that I'll get one. And so it makes more sense to really um, combine those two nodes, two grid nodes into a cluster or into a scenario and just uh, assess them together rather than doing it one at a time. So that could be, uh, that. Uh, that's another way of approaching the same problem. Um, and then there are temporal variations that we could also address, um, meaning like, you know, there are uh, static or snapshot modes that we could uh, look at and also the time series variation that we could look at. So this one here uh, takes another level of deeper look of how single location-based uh, hosting capacity methodology is formed. So we, what we do is we go by one node at a time, um, set up the performance parameters, such as the limits that you uh, want to look at for the performance, voltage and thermal, and what are the types of data models or feeders that you want to account for. Um, and the, and the result and result is actually the DVR hosting capacity. So all in all, once we are done, then you get to see this heat map where we have uh, different pockets of <coughs> high hosting capacity or low hosting capacity um, levels at the same grid. Excuse me. Next slide. 
Okay, so this is again how we design those clusters or scenarios here. Uh, depending on some guiding criteria, we can um, design this database where we have PV scenarios or EV scenarios in place. And even on top of that, uh, we can think about what type of um, load representation or snapshot representation uh, we want to focus on. So uh, sometimes having a minimum data and load is helpful because that gives us more, um, more range as far as EVs go. Uh, sometimes we want to look at the maximum base load when we are more thinking about EVs. Um, and then the another common approach that we are seeing um, our utility collaborators are preferring is really looking at the whole time series, like having the 8760 data points and really looking at the hosting capacity as a range instead of a single window. Next slide, please. So this is the EV hosting capacity for in particular, and um, we are picking it up from a current project that we are working on. So it this one is focused on, again, having uh, EV hosting capacity analysis for n number of feeders. So this is something we can do um, if you have a lot of number of feeders. Again, as I mentioned earlier, um, you might want to rely on a, a high performance computing architecture just to handle the computational burden. Um, and that's where the job parallelization, the job desegregation comes into place. But again, that's not necessary if you have just a few feeders and your local machine can handle those simulations. So um, that's, this is what we do. We keep this iterative process that goes through uh, n number of feeders, uh, looking at voltage and or thermal violations, and really coming up with um, acceptable levels of EV chargers that can be accommodated within a grid condition. Next slide, please. All right, so with that, I'll hand it over to my colleague Sharon to talk about the automated upgrade cost module and the rest of the slides. Thank you. Thank you, Shivani. Um, I'll now go over the next capability of this research tool, and that's called the automated upgrade cost analysis. As the name suggests, this tool is used to identify the upgrades that are needed in the distribution system um, in order to mitigate violations and also estimate costs. Um, now, this is done by means of looking at thermal upgrades or voltage and voltage upgrades by looking at transformers and lines replacement if they're overloaded, and then looking at voltage management devices, adding new voltage management devices or changing their settings. And at the end, uh, costs are computed for the new equipments that are added. Uh, this, this particular analysis is challenging because there are quite a few design considerations that are taken into account while making these decisions. And so uh, this module that was added to this research tool was to kind of give the capability to perform a competitive analysis between various grid integration technologies. Uh, I'd like to spend some time on the inputs. Uh, as with any analysis, our outputs are as good or better with the good set of inputs if we have that. And so to start off with, um, we have the distribution system feeder models um, in an open DSS format. But like Shivani mentioned, um, there are also capabilities where you can uh, convert models from another format into open DSS if there is a need for that. Um, and so with these open DSS models, PowerFlow is run and the analysis is performed. Uh, the other input that is required is the cost database, since we are estimating costs in this case. And so it includes unit costs for different types of grid infrastructure. Um, and we also have an input requirement for a technical catalog that contains the possible upgrade options for transformers and lines. Um, another set of inputs that uh, can be provided to customize the analysis for your requirement are some thresholds. So if you uh, if you would like to define overloads uh, differently than 100%, then you have the capability or the ability to do that by customizing these parameters that are provided as inputs to the analysis. And then once we are uh, given those inputs and 
run the module, um, as an output, we get um, the power quality metrics before and after upgrades. So this includes uh, the number of violations in lines, transformers, voltages, and as well as um, it also includes the costs per equipment upgrade. I do want to point out that the costs computed here are the count multiplied by the unit cost of that upgrade. So these include the equipment costs only. Other additional costs uh, could be included if they are available. And another thing to also uh, make note of is that while attributing costs to any specific uh, objective of distribution grid planning, uh, like electrification, uh, we also should take into account uh, that it also uh, contributes to other uh, attributes and objectives, uh, such as uh, replacements needed due to aging infrastructure, improving reliability, uh, improving the resilience of the system, and so on. And so assessing value streams is something that also should be uh, well understood while interpreting the costs that are received as an output from this module. So I'd like to now get into some of the use cases and applications where we have used DISCO. We've had uh, the opportunity to work on a wide variety of projects uh, that utilize uh, various capabilities mentioned uh, that are a part of this research tool. And so these, so these applications are spread across uh, the country in different climate zones, and they also have um, the they vary in scale, as well as in uh, application and outputs. And so, I'd what I've listed out here are some of the projects where we've used uh, either the hosting capacity or the automated upgrade cost module. Uh, like I mentioned, some of these projects uh, were large scale looking at 2000 plus distribution feeders where we performed a comparative analysis between snapshot and dynamic hosting capacity. Um, and it had a direct uh, use of the outputs, which was the hosting capacity metrics. Um, on the other end, we've also um, performed an analysis on a single feeder, for example, with uh, in a cold climate city in northeastern U US, uh, we looked at a, a a single feeder to understand uh, impacts of building electrification as well as building efficiency upgrades um, on distribution grid costs and uh, looking at how a combination of these could be uh, used to plan the future grid. Um, another aspect, uh, another application that we uh, had recently was with uh, the Los Angeles 100% Renewable Energy Study. Uh, equity strategies, where um, we determined the grid impacts and the costs on the feeders in the territory to compute the grid equity score and identify equitable strategies. And so this is where we try to assess the uh, equity by computing an equity score, which was derived from the metrics that we got out of DISCO. And in an, in an effort to understand how investments could be prioritized to ensure equitable access to energy. So now I'll get, we'll also get into a few of these projects in a little more detail in the subsequent slides. I'll start with the simplest example. And so we're looking at one single feeder here, and we're just looking at how uh, upgrades were, uh, are used to kind of mitigate the violations that we see. So in the figure on the left, um, is a smart DS feeder in the San Francisco region that has 200% uh, PV adoption levels, and which introduces um, around 21 line and transformer violations in total. Um, and so if we, we wanted to arrive at a model which uh, did not see any of those violations and was able to accommodate that level of PV, and so running it through the upgrade an analysis, we were able to arrive at that uh, electric feeder model, which could accommodate that level of PV adoption. So this is a simplest example of an application of the module. Getting into a little more complexity, uh, this is again for a single feeder, but looking at uh, varying levels of PV adoption. So in the previous uh, use case, we looked at 
one level of PV adoption. Um, here, what we're looking at uh, from zero to 200% of PV adoption levels. Um, and so we run all those scenarios uh, through the module. And um, on the figure on the left, you, you can see the number of violations by PV penetration, where the red indicates transformers and the uh, red indicates lines and the blue indicates transformers. And on the right, you can see the costs that were needed to mitigate those violations and resolve them so that yeah, the, the PV of that level can be accommodated completely. And so as you can see, as an example, at around 90% of PV penetration, we see some trans, uh, transformers uh, being overloaded. Um, and so looking at the figure on the right, you can see that with a certain level of investment, in the grid, you can increase uh, the hosting capacity from around 90 to 110%. Uh, and so this can help in you know, assessing incremental PV integration costs. Uh, and you can also look at impacts on different equipments one at a time as well. So this is a one step further than what I've discussed previously uh, for a single feeder, but looking at, you know, how increasing levels of DER adoption can impact the grid. Coming to uh, my next use case, and this is uh, from the Los Angeles 100% Renewable Energy Study. Um, before I get into the figure, I, I also want to mention that uh, we've placed a link here that you can go in and also take a look at uh, the, the figures in more detail. For this effort, we were trying to understand the what is needed in the distribution system, the costs associated to achieve 100% renewable energy pathway in the city of Los Angeles. And so um, on around 1500 plus feeders, uh, we use DISCO to identify grid impacts of um, a few different scenarios of 100% uh, pathways and assessed the impacts on the grid as well as the costs associated with that. And what you see here is a map uh, that is also on this website where we are looking at um, this shows the violation number of violations before upgrades were performed um, in different place parts of the city of Los Angeles. And so you can see in the areas in dark purple are areas that see the highest number of violations. And so this is information that could potentially aid in uh, planning the grid or planning investments in the grid and so on. As a continuation, I would like to get on to an, uh, talk about another effort um, with the Los Angeles 100% study equity strategies. And so, like I mentioned briefly in my previous slide, um, for this particular um, application, we were trying to understand how investments can be prioritized uh, to ensure that there is equitable access uh, across all the community members in a city. And so for to this end, we had to combine uh, demographic metrics and socioeconomic metrics along with the technical metrics that we uh, look at within our modeling to understand grid equity. And so in this particular effort, what I have here is a flowchart, um, which kind of outlines our workflow that we followed. So we started with feeder model preparation. And again, feeder model preparation includes, uh, in this case, includes income differentiated load profiles. It includes EV adoption patterns. It includes PV and storage adoption. And so there's a lot that is baked into this one box. Um, which are also very important pieces while, de while developing input models. And, um, and then DISCO was used, the automated upgrade analysis cost module was used to understand grid impacts um, for the 2035 scenario, and also as, uh, arrive at the upgrades needed and the costs associated with that. And these metrics that were received as outputs were then post-processed and combined along with the socioeconomic metrics to arrive at a grid equity score and the DR access score, which, um, which is kind of like the stepping stone to then understand how investments could potentially be prioritized. I'll, I'll go on to another use case here. Um, and so this is this particular use case, uh, we worked, we collaborated with another um, tool called Urbanopt. 
Um, and this was to understand how building efficient, building electrification and building efficiency of grids um, in a community or a neighborhood along with um, grid infrastructure could potentially be the key to, mit to plan for the future grid. So what are the combination of mitigation strategies that are needed uh, in order to allow for electrification in the future? So this was a stab at um, working more closely with uh, the loads and trying to integrate that into the workflow uh, to, for grid planning. And so in this particular case, we worked with a particular neighborhood um, in which the baseline had a mix of residential and commercial loads. And a scenario of uh, electrification was analyzed uh, along with some efficiency upgrades. Um, and we and severe power quality issues were observed uh, because there was a four times increase in load. And then DISCO was used to analyze the traditional upgrades that are needed the, that could potentially mitigate those violations. Uh, one thing to note also, like I mentioned before, is these costs uh, are attributed not only to electrification, but they also help in uh, the aid in the aging infrastructure that might need to already be replaced and improve the reliability and improve the resilience. And so we need to account for all of these objectives and all of these value streams while evaluating the costs that we get out of here. Um, and also this workflow can potentially help us with uh, performing a comparative analysis with another, um, another potential technology that could help in uh, accommodating electrification. So that brings me to some of the future directions. I know I went through a, a, a few use cases and applications, and hopefully that gives an idea of how the, how the outputs from this tool can be used directly or indirectly to answer some of the questions that Shivani spoke about. And also as we move towards, as we are a part of this energy transition, thinking about what planning a future distribution grid looks like. And so some of the, I've listed out very few possible future directions, but this is not, this is a very small list and it, there's a lot more that can be done when we're thinking about planning for the future distribution grid. One aspect that Shivani had touched on in her slides was the EV hosting capacity. And uh, that is currently uh, in progress and being integrated into DISCO as a part of an ongoing effort. And so potentially expanding these impact studies and including cluster-based analysis as well is one possible direction that we are thinking of. Um, like I mentioned in the upgrade cost analysis module, we do use a cost, a unit cost database. And so uh, potentially updating this cost database uh, to reflect latest costs that are in uh, that are relevant today. And also creating a feedback to, you know, like determine placement of DERs in order to manage costs. Um, and the, the research tool DISCO was uh, built um, as a part of quite a few applications and new projects that um, I touched on a few previously. And so I do want to recognize that there are a lot of areas in which it can be improved. We've, we've been able to make improvements due to the variability in data that we received from uh, different partners, as well as uh, different input sources that we've had. However, there are improvements that can be made to uh, the usability and the uh, readability of this tool, and also streamlining model intake so that the, the process and workflow can become uh, seamless from start to end as well. Uh, we'd also be happy to uh, chat and discuss any other potential directions that are of interest uh, to uh, you all here today. This brings me close to the end of these, uh, this presentation. Um, we also have here um, a list of some references that are links to reports in case you are interested to uh, go back and take a look at any of these use cases and applications that I mentioned previously. Uh, so you should have this with you. Um, hopefully you get access to these slides and then you can take a look at these reports. They're all available um, online. Thank you so much for your attention here. And at this time, we are we can open up for any questions that you might have. 
Thank you, Sharin. So we could go over the questions that we are seeing in the Q&A tab. And I'll encourage everyone to um, type your questions there and we'll go through them one by one. Um, okay, so looking at the Q&A tab, um, I'll just go through the ones that I see first here. Uh, Dominique asked, does this tool have integration with Precise Tool, which was presented for aiding the analysis of customer-owned PV interconnection? Uh, great question. Thank you, Dominique. This, as of right now, we don't have a pipeline in place where Precise and Disco can work together. And the reason being, Precise answers a different set of questions uh, compared to what we are hoping for with Disco. Uh, but having said that, if there is a need of um, bringing these tools together to answer a common question such as, um, you know, what could be the hosting capacity for a low voltage set of customers that could be easily answered here. And one commonality that I want to um, highlight here is, you know, uh, both our enroll developed tools and the core team, the developer team is actually here working in the same uh, group. So it's very, very much easy for us to really design an interface that can bring these tools together. Um, I hope that answered the questions. Question. Um, okay, thank you. Uh, there's the next question. Is optimization involved to identify upgrades with list cost solution? I can take that question. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, so the current approach for determining upgrades is a heuristics-based approach. Uh, we had considered the use of optimization. However, um, in with terms of uh, performance and uh, so on, we did not go with that. We Currently, it looks at, um, is there a violation? And if there is, what is the next based on the design parameters that you have mentioned? So for example, if a transformer is 130% overloaded, and you've mentioned that uh, that is identified as a violation. And so now if you say in your design specs um, that any new added transformer should be loaded only 75%, then the next available size such that the new transformer is loaded only 75% is chosen. So we do not use optimization in this case. Uh, we uh, it, it takes a look at the design specs and then makes the decision. I hope that answers your question. Thank you, Sharon. Okay, so the next question is from Ritwik. Uh, does this modeling exercise consider consumer segment-wise distribution feeder data with respective diary? Uh, very good question. Thank you, Ritwik, for asking that. Uh, I can comment on the overall uh, tool architecture, and then I, I'll hand it over to you, Sharon, to answer from the upgrade module aspect. So um, we have in the past done a project where it's, it was part of the post-processing where, you know, we were trying to understand uh, the other side of um, energy costs where uh, we have commercial and residential loads and we considered their energy costs, including uh, these different types of tariffs. So that's what we have done, but that was part of the uh, post-processing block as we're trying to compare those energy costs against upgrade costs or uh, embedded control costs. Uh, but beyond that, Shane, I don't know if you want anything to add from the um, automated cost modular uh, aspect. Yeah, I think that uh, on the same line as you mentioned, um, um, as a part of the, once you get the outputs of, um, you know, for example, here the upgrade costs, and then you identify that, uh, as a part of the post-processing, you can take a look at um, the residential or the commercial loads. Uh, and also you can add in tariffs if it needed based on that kind of question that you're trying to answer here. Um, as a part of the equity strategies effort that I mentioned, we did not directly use tariffs in that case. However, um, I bring that example because uh, that is one use case of where we took in the outputs that we got out of Disco, but then we also looked at it along with other metrics that were the socioeconomic metrics. And so look at it along with that and then try to answer the question that we were focused on. 
Thank you, Shane. The next question is uh, more on the housekeeping side. Will a recording of this webinar be shared to registered participants? I believe yes, uh, but Emily, if you want to add anything there. Yes, so a recording will be shared with anyone who registered to the email that you registered with in about a week. And we will also be posting the recording and slides to the Powered by Webinar Series webpage, which I just dropped the link to that in the chat. Thank you. All right, the next question is from Linda. In Maine, the Public Utilities Commission said a transmission and distribution utility shall submit to the commission a 10-year plan that includes specific actions for addressing the expected effects of climate change on the utilities assets. And that's needed to transmit and distribute electricity to its customers. To, uh, and this is done to comply with the main statute. Utilities must also provide an update to the climate plan every three years. How would Maine's transmission and distribution utilities access DISCO modeling? Can they use the DISCO outputs to update their climate plans? Can municipalities, users of electricity, also access DISCO analysis? Uh, that is a very good question, and I appreciate Linda uh, for asking this question. Um, from what I can get in this description, it's uh, really creating different types of climate changing scenarios and embedding them into the disk analysis pipeline here. So that is something we can definitely do. Uh, beyond, beyond that, uh, the usability question, if, uh, if you heard us talk about uh, some underlying assumptions for this tool, like it's built on Python, it, uh, it needs a certain level of understanding of uh, how power flow models or power planning models are designed. So um, with that expertise in place, um, I believe that we can um, design a few one-on-one -on -one sessions where we answer some questions. It's obviously an open source tool. Um, and as you try and understand uh, the usage of this tool, uh, but what would be more fruitful or more valuable here is really um, trying to have a more focused conversation on the use cases that you have in mind and see if we need to do any modification um, in the disco tool right now to address those concerns. But the use case of the application that you have just pasted here, Linda, thank you very much for that. We are always looking forward to having um, these applications that we can use with disco and really help out uh, PUCs, utilities um, altogether. So um, yeah, having said that, we can um, hopefully connect later and see if there is a pathway for us to um, answer this question better. Thank you. All right, the next question is possible future improvements considering PV plus batteries. Uh, yeah, thank you, that's a very, um, Good point, Leonardo. Uh, this, this is obviously something that we are looking at, not only with Disco, but other projects too, because PVs uh, right now, they are being paired with batteries a lot of the time. So that's uh, part of the modeling exercises. And as you heard sharing, like uh, some of the future directions that we have based us together are really, I mean, we wanna do a lot of things with Disco and really take it to a different directions to explore but uh, we only mentioned a couple in this presentation, but obviously that's one of the things that we are actively working on, um, part of different type of projects. So hopefully in near future, we can embed that as part of the Disco pipeline. Thank you. All right, uh, thank you, Justin, for your comment. I am glad to hear that you found this uh, session very helpful. Um, please reach out to us if you have any following questions or if we uh, can help with understanding this tool better. Um, with that, I see the last question here, which is from Robert Thomas. Do you use an expected 87 load or a P90 or P10 8760 load? That is a great question. Uh, the 8760 data points are actually inputs that we design or you um, as a user can um, 
put together for this pipeline. So it really depends on how you want to um, how you want to design that problem. Like if a P90 or a P10 8760 load will be of more interest, then that can be the input instead of a typical 8760 load. So that's something we can do. Um, so far, the projects or the use cases that we've talked about, we've only uh, looked at a typical 8760 or even pieces of those load profiles, but a P90 or a P10 can easily be um, used as an input for those uh, situations. So you'll have a hosting capacity or read impact analysis or the automated upgrade cost analysis done based on those uh, stochastic time series inputs instead of the real data or the captured data. Thank you, Robert. I hope that answered the questions. The question. Um, Charles Karnick, you had mentioned a future improvement to streamline um, model intake or something like that. Can you please talk more about that? Uh, great question. Thank you, Charles. So what we mean obviously is, as you can understand, um, the DISCO is a researcher focused tool and it does have a ton of capabilities under the hood that we could leverage here. Uh, but having said that, one area of improvement that we are looking forward to is really um, making it easier for a new user, even if they're a researcher, to uh, do that model import. Like if you have a set of open DSS model ready to begin with, then how can you easily get that uh, started in the whole pipeline? So that is um, that is something we still, I, we feel like there's a, there are rooms for improvement. So that's why uh, we mentioned it here because that could really um, hopefully make the lives easier for any new users uh, who are interested in this book. Um, I don't know, Shane, if you wanna add anything to that point, to that last point. Uh, nothing more to add, Shivani. Yeah, thank you. All right, if anyone has any additional questions, be sure to enter them in that Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Um, as we're waiting for any last ones to come in, I'll just remind everyone that we are going to send out a feedback form after this webinar. Um, so if you have any comments, um, you can enter those there. Um, Another reminder, we're posting the recording of this webinar on the Powered by Webinar Series webpage and sending it out to all the registrants in about a week. Um, and if you want to go on to the next slide for me, Sharon. I also wanna remind everyone that our next webinar in this series is on the Reads tool, um, which is NREL's flagship capacity modeling for the power sector. Um, so NREL Stuart Cohen will be presenting that, and it will take place on May 14th at 10 a.m. Mountain Time, 12 p.m. Eastern. Um, be sure to register by uh, 3 p.m. Mountain or 5 p.m. Eastern the day before. Um, and you can check out all the other um, Powered by webinars that we will be doing in the series on the webpage, which is the last link in the chat. Um, and you can just double check all the dates and topics that we have planned so far. So thanks everyone for joining. It looks like we don't have any additional questions so we can wrap up a few minutes early.